We are in Chapter 10, uh, Section 3, talking about the process of how we select the President of the United States. This specifically is talking about the Electoral College. Uh, two people up there uh, on the left side is former Vice President Al Gore. On the right side is former President George Bush. Uh, they ran against each other in the 2000 election, which was very, very tight. Um, through the whole process, uh, Gore won the popular vote, and George Bush uh, won the Electoral College vote, which means that he became the next president of the United States. Uh, through, through this process, I want you to think of this next thing as true or false. The presidential candidate who wins the mo most popular vote is elected president, and the answer is obviously not necessarily. Uh, when I talked about what we saw from the beginning was uh, Al Gore and George Bush, and that, that was the third time in the United States history uh, that the person who won more votes of the population actually lost the presidency, with the fourth time coming in 2016 when Hillary Clinton received more votes than Donald Trump. So the historical background of the Electoral College is the framers of the Constitution disagreed on how we had to elect a president. Some people thought we should have the Congress select who would be the president, and other people thought we had a, should do a direct popular election based off the people. So the Electoral College was a compromise for both of those groups, combining the features of both approaches. In the United States Constitution, it, it's, it outlines how the president is to be elected. The two main sections that deal with the electing the president are Article 1, Section 2, which is the United States Census that happens every 10 years and determines how our population uh, should either gain or lose districts. Article 2, Section 1, talks specifically about the Electoral College and why we use that program. The Electoral College also reflects the federal nature of the Constitution. And what that does is it ensures states have a role in selecting the president, not just people. So when you vote for president, you're actually voting for an elector to vote for you. Uh, each state has a determined number of electors. The state's uh, number of electors is the number of the state senators and the representatives in the House. So North Carolina, for instance, has two senators and 13 representatives, so 15 total electors. California has 53 representatives and two senators, so 55 electors. And these electors tend to be people who are all former party bosses or people who have prestigious backgrounds in the history of political causes. Here you look at the electoral map um, from what we see. Um, when you look at this, what we see is, of course, uh, at the bottom it says the blue, blue and red states have voted for the same party since the election of 2000 or even earlier. Those are states that uh, on the left, uh, the blue side are the Democratic states or the red side are Republican states. We see these as kind of like a, a studying history. These states tend to trend a certain direction, with other states being in the swing states, like where we live in Pennsylvania, where we voted for Barack Obama twice, um, but voted for Donald Trump in the last election. So you voted for a Democrat in two out of the last three elections. Uh, same thing with Ohio, uh, Virginia, North Carolina, Florida. Uh, people always often say, well, why is Florida, you know, and they're so deep red here, all the states down here are red, why is Florida one of those gray areas? Well, I want you to think about the population of Florida, and what you see is a lot of people who live in Florida tend to come from this area up here, what we call the Rust Belt. Um, a lot of people of the retirement age move from, um, from Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, New York, down to Florida uh, for retirement, so that's why you see a lot of that population centers there. We know um, within the, our, our lifetimes, most likely these states are going to shift around or the, the, the population trends may move. Uh, in Texas, for instance, you have a large um, population of Latinos, uh, which you can see that population shifting towards a more moderate stance or perhaps a liberal voting record. So there are a total of 538 electoral votes. We also gave the District of Columbia um, uh, three electoral votes because they're not a state. Um, we wanted that area, the District of Columbia, to be free from local politics. So in order for those people to actually have a say in who wins the president, we were able to take and give three electoral votes to the District of Columbia. So the question again is, who are the electors? And the electors are individuals selected in each state to officially cast the state's electoral votes. The framers anticipated that the electors would be the state leaders or who would exercise good judgment. Today, party leaders um, select electors who are typically lifelong uh, party activists. 
and electors almost always vote for their party's candidates. As of the last election, there was 58 opportunities or 58 times in history where the elector uh, did not vote the way that their state cast it. 48 of our 50 states have a winner-take-all method, uh, which means that the candidate must win 50% uh, plus one vote um, in order to take all the delegates from the state. In order for a presidential candidate to win all the electoral votes of a state, the candidate must win the majority of that popular vote. Two other states are different, and they divide up their votes based off of congressional districts. Those states are Nebraska and Maine. So the election timeline and what we're talking about is first thing is in November of a presidential election year, the general election is held and the popular vote is determined. In December, the electors gather in their respective state capitals to cast votes or ballots for the president and the vice president. In January, Congress comes into session and they open the ballots to receive from each state. At this time, they announce the official outcome. So again, in November, there is a, a statistical possibility that who we vote for that night not could win the presidency, uh, you know, or something else could work there. A candidate must have 270 electoral votes to win the presidential election. If no single candidate gets the required 270 votes, the House of Representatives vote to decide the president. So, for instance, in 2020, right now, um, right now we have a Congress or House of Representatives that is uh, Democratic. Um, so what would happen is if the president's uh, the presidential election, neither party got the 270 votes, the House of Representatives would decide who would be president. So if no one receives a majority and they don't receive that 270 um, electoral votes, uh, the House of Representatives selects the president from among three presidential candidates with the most electoral votes. If this happens, each state has one vote. And it only happened once in 1824 where Congress chose John Quincy Adams over Andrew Jackson and Henry Clay. The Senate selects the vice president from the top two vice presidential candidates. So this means that there could, if you have a Senate that's controlled by the different party, you could actually have a split ticket or a party um, where the president would be one party and the vice president be another. So it's possible to get more votes overall in the election from the entire country and still not be elected president. You've seen this in 2016 in the popular vote. Donald Trump won 306 electoral votes to Hillary Clinton's 232. He received 62.9 million votes. She received 65.8 million votes. So about 3 million votes she won by, um, but Donald Trump carried the electoral vote, which is how you win the election in the United States. So when we look back at uh, presidential elections, you can see here, for instance, a very close one. Now, this map doesn't do a really good job because uh, the Democrat is uh, represented in red this time and the Republican is in blue, which is usually opposite whenever we look at uh, presidential politics. But this is a very close one that I showed you from the beginning picture between George Bush and Al Gore. Um, one of the things I want to point out here is George Bush won with 271 electoral votes. One person did not vote, which means... If in the electoral votes, if two more people decided that they didn't want to vote for George Bush in the election, we would have a split or tiebreaker. That would have taken us to uh, the House of Representatives where the election would happen for president. Now, when you look at these maps, I, I want to say here, um, when you look at these, uh, the, the country layout for the, the election um, of 2000, if you looked at it, the layman would say, wow, like the red kicked some butt. Um, when you look at it, counties won. Bush won 243 uh, or 34 uh, counties. Gore won only 677. In square miles of counties won, Bush 2.4 million to 580,000 for Gore. In population of counties won, Bush won 143 million to Gore's 127 million. But what the thing is, when you look at it, it the, the fact of the matter is where these little areas of blue are, these little pockets, those tend to be more metropolitan areas, which meant more the cities where the people are actually living. Um, and in this election, Al Gore actually wins the popular vote, despite the fact that it looks like you would see a red landslide. The final results, uh, results is sized according to the numbers of votes in the Electoral College. Here it looks more evenly split. 50-50 uh, votes whenever you're looking at uh, the election. 
The largest landslide that we've ever seen in presidential history was in 1984 when President, uh, um, sitting President Ronald Reagan defeated uh, Walter Mondale for the uh, presidency. So there are some benefits that we have to the Electoral College system. The system first requires a distribution of popular support and not just sufficient support and contributes to national unity. There is also enhancement or protection of minority interests of the small states. It encourages a two-party system and thus national stability within our government and maintains a federal system which gives the states a role in selecting their president. Thus the smaller, less populous states, the two major parties, and the minority should favor the electoral college system. However, there are a lot of criticisms of the electoral college. The first thing is the popular vote winner can lose the presidency, which we've seen four times in history. Electors may vote for persons other than their party's presidential and vice presidential candidate. So, for instance, if you're an elector and you decide that you're against that candidate after the fact, you could really vote for Ronald McDonald to become president of the United States. There's nothing legally binding you to vote the way your state asks you to. And if no candidate receives a majority, popular uh, Congress will pick the president and the vice president, which again takes out of our hands the national election. There's a lot of also proposals for reform. The first thing is to eliminate all electors but still count the electoral vote, which takes away that ability for the person to change their mind because they're not bound to the results of the state. The second one, which is becoming uh, gaming a lot of steam, is the idea of choosing the president by the direct popular election. There are a few states that have actually talked about tying their electoral votes to the overall popular vote um, in the United States, which means the state would be bound not by the people inside the state, but be bound by the national um, electoral vote. So there you have it. It's how the electoral college works. It's inside and outside. Um, we talked about the benefits and also the criticisms of what happens. Regardless of, of your opinion, it's still the law of the land unless Congress decided to constitutionally amend it and change the way we vote for president in the United States.